Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Judith Kurt Darling. My day job is as one of seven elected members of the Secretariat of the European Trade Union Confederation. Uh, the European Trade Union Confederation brings together about 60 million workers across Europe, uh, 36 European countries, so bigger than the EU. Um, and uh, we represent workers in every sector and every industry. Um, and within that framework, I've been asked, um, I'm also a member of Belgium and Luxembourg monthly meeting, but not a very um, regular attender, I have to say, because uh, um, it's very difficult. Pardon? It's a yearly meeting. It's a yearly meeting. Oh, you see, this is, I'm so out of date with my own meetings. It's terrible. Um, but um, I've been asked this morning to give you a kind of thought-provoking introduction so that you go and you have interesting debates in the workshop. So I'm happy to um, have a discussion afterwards, but also hopefully I'll, I'll give some inspiration or some input into the rest of the day. And if I haven't, then your uh, concerns that I haven't will be input into the conversations afterwards, um, I'm sure as well. I've been asked to speak um, about how we as Quakers uh, can contribute to the building of a just and sustainable economy which meets human needs without destroying the planet. And I know that last night um, you had quite a comprehensive view of the current economic uh, situation in which we find ourselves and the social situation. So I've tried to keep that part to a minimum um, in what I'm going to say to try and complement what Trevor said last night and maybe fill in some of the gaps as I see them. Um, and I'll start off from what I do on a daily basis. Tomorrow, um, I'm not going to be able to be with you for the rest of the weekend because I'm going to Warsaw um, and I'm travelling to Warsaw to take part in the what's called the 19th Conference of Parties to the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, in UN jargon, that's COP19 of the UNFCCC. <laughs> <coughs> and um, Quakers like acronyms. The UN loves acronyms. The EU's addicted to acronyms. So I'm going to try and give a speech where I explain the acronyms that I introduce. And if I don't, feel free to interrupt if it's just a question about what the issue, you know, the, the subject is, a clarification. But um, we'll try and keep all of the substantive questions to the end. So, I'm going to Warsaw tomorrow. This will be my third COP, as we call it. It's not a decisive COP. Um, it's going to be a stepping stone. The aim is to have an international agreement on um, climate change and tackling um, greenhouse gas emissions by the end of 2015. So, the aim is to have an agreement in two years' time. That makes this a working COP where um, discussions will be ongoing. But it's going to be a very difficult COP. Um, Poland is a country in which 90% of electricity is created through coal burning power stations. The costs of transforming the Polish energy sector um, are considerable. And Polish society is absolutely paralysed by the, the fear of the costs of that transformation. And the, the reality that energy poverty is rising extremely quickly and it's rising as wages don't keep up with living costs and, um, and the pace of prices. So it's always been my view um, that if we're going to talk about guaranteeing a just transition towards a more sustainable economy, then it's in places like Poland, like Katowice, which is in the south of Poland, heavy industry town, or my hometown of Middlesbrough, with its heavy chemicals industry and um, industrial base, but both places which also have chronic problems of unemployment and rising poverty, it's in those places that we have to talk about how we create a just transition. And that just transition has to be about delivering sustainable jobs, a fairer economy and hope for people. And so I thought today that it would be this vision that I would focus on um, about how we get there and, um, and maybe hear your ideas about whether we're missing some of the points um, on the way. Now, 
<coughs> our scientific knowledge and understanding of climate change has taken leaps forward. And last month, we saw the publication of the latest findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which suggests that we're heading for a temperature increase on average globally of about three to four uh, degrees Celsius. Um, that's a, an increase that we haven't seen for millions of years. It's something that we can't really comprehend what impact um, it will have on our societies. And despite um, that scientific knowledge, what we see is that our capacity internationally to address the clear threats our species face within this century, that's a temperature rise by 2100, so within this century, um, are stalling. And they're stalling largely as a result of the economic crisis, as a result of a resurgent business as usual model, and as a result of blockages from powerful vested interests. If I give you a contrast, whilst the climate negotiations are stalled and partially blocked, trade policy negotiations are racing ahead. Um, yesterday, I know Chris, who's somewhere at the back, and I were in a stakeholder meeting um, after the second round of trade negotiations between the EU and the US, the so-called TTIP, again an acronym, it's the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, between the EU and the US. That trade uh, negotiation will cover about 50% of world GDP if it's concluded. It's a colossal negotiation. In the last week, we've seen the apparent conclusion of a trade uh, uh, deal with Canada for a free trade um, agreement. And meanwhile, within the WTO, we have a group of countries which include all of our own countries, all the OECD countries. They call themselves uh, the very good friends of services. And they're currently negotiating a new global agreement on trade and services, which will push for far deeper and more radical liberalisation and privatisation of public services than what we've um, seen to date. All of these agreements essentially increase the power of multinational companies over our economies, our democratic systems and our natural resources. Um, and I, I'm happy to come back to the trade justice and trade policy agenda in the questions, but I would just flag up that um, a little bit of advertising for QCA. Apparently there's a new blog on QCA's website fleshing out the main issues related to these EU negotiations and particularly the EU-US negotiations, if you want to learn a little bit more. But so in this context where we have a really strong, um, and I'm careful to use it, but a very strong neoliberal push for a more aggressive business as usual model, um, alongside um, a stalled agenda in terms of sustainable development and climate change, I'm quite nervous about getting on the, the way to Warsaw tomorrow. Because I know that when I arrive in Warsaw, I'll be negotiating as much with Polish mining workers as I'm negotiating with government representatives. And that's, if you've ever met a Polish miner, I can assure you, <laughs> it's quite a challenge. Um, but that's the way that I personally put my faith in our peace and social justice testimony into action every day in the way that I work and the, the work that I'm doing trying to find negotiated solutions, tackling the root causes of conflict, and trying to build alliances between people who don't necessarily see the alliances that they might have. Now, I'd like to step back away from uh, my, my own travel agenda uh, to put this in a broader context. Um, Europe's in a quite <coughs> fundamental crisis, and it's a crisis which has many dimensions to it. And each one of the dimensions poses fundamental questions about how we can create a sustainable economy in the future. I know that Trevor ran through this, so I'm going to go very quickly, but we have 26 million people out of work across the EU. This is historic, we, globally, we have historically high unemployment levels. Uh, we face a social and unemployment crisis of a scale that we haven't really seen since uh, the 1930s. 
workers across Europe are uh, paying for a crisis which was created in the financial markets through uh, cuts in their terms and conditions, through their pay, through um, uh, job cuts, and also through reduced public services and the, the, the attack that we're seeing on the welfare state in many countries. If we look at our young, and I'll come back to this, then the headline figures are really enormously shocking. If you think of half of a young population in Greece or in Spain or in Italy being unemployed, then that's a figure that we hear kind of thrown around a lot in the press. But if you think about Sweden, Sweden also has one of the highest unemployment, youth unemployment figures in the EU. There's a youth unemployment crisis, even in countries who are doing relatively well in terms of the overall economy. And that, um, that unemployment and economic insecurity is effectively widening the gap between rich and poor in Europe. It's making us a much more unequal and a much more divided Europe. Um, and it's feeding the, the rise of political populism um, and as on the back of political populism, we see the increase in terms of scapegoating of migrants and minorities, really in every country. In addition, the economic uncertainties are playing their part in making people less concerned about the environmental challenge and the crisis and climate change. At a time when, as I said, we know that we're pushing the planet to its limit in consuming energy and natural resources at a totally unsustainable rate. Since 2011-2012, what we've seen at European level in analysing national policies is that we've moved from austerity policies to what we call black austerity policies. And that's where um, all, lots of the focus in national austerity measures are focused on pulling back the incentives and subsidies which were put in place to support the green economy. Um, those are being pulled back in the name of fiscal consolidation, whether it's support for renewables uh, rollout, whether it's support for R&D programmes for new technologies. And increasingly, what we see at, um, in the public debate is a focus on the need to ensure affordable energy, to tackle our competitiveness, um, and uh, to, to um, address these as, as the priority. These are false priorities in reality. It's short-termism in the extreme. It's short-termism economically, environmentally and socially. And underneath this we have two contradictory ideas which currently shape the mainstream political debate. The first is the fundamental argument for austerity that states cannot and should not live beyond their financial means. And the second is the idea that we can and must, in effect, live beyond our environmental means. And these two ideas run right through the middle of our political debate. This internal contradiction has enormous and long-term implications for our social cohesion within and between countries. Now, I quoted from the Swarthmore Lecture, uh, which was in Canterbury, where there was a large focus on sustainable development, so, so that I've cited my sources and nobody uh, thinks that I'm plagiarising. But there, it was very clearly said that there's a saying that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, but rather we borrow it from our children and their children's children. And we're currently borrowing more than we can pay back, and it's not only about carbon emissions. Earth Overshoot Day is the point in the year when we've used up as much of the Earth's total resources as the Earth itself can regenerate in a year. Since the late 1980s, we've been going into eco-deficit each year, progressively degrading the whole <coughs> environment, with the Overshoot Day arriving a little earlier every year. This year, we celebrated the Overshoot Day on the 22nd of August. That's the day when we've used more than the earth can provide. And all of the, I know lots of the focus yesterday was on our sovereign debt, on our debt crisis in Europe. But the obliviousness to ecological debt is characteristic of an economic system in which the interests of, of finance come first. 
and which fails to recognise the environmental and social foundations of prosperity. As a result, money flows into things that maximise short-term financial returns rather than optimising overall value for the economy and society. Now, the contradiction between our approach to good financial and good ecological management is stark enough, but it's even worse than it first appears. Our planetary boundaries are far from unlimited. In 2009, a group of 28 internationally renowned scientists identified and quantified a set of nine planetary boundaries. Those boundaries are um, climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, ozone layer, chemicals dis uh, dispersion, land system change, nitrogen and phosphorus in the biosphere, Aerosol, uh, atmospheric aerosol loading and fresh water and they argued that they could fix the line or they could give an indication and a planetary boundary um, <clears throat> at which humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. Crossing these boundaries could generate abrupt or irreversible environmental changes. Respecting the boundaries reduces the risk to human society. It's the most vulnerable and least influential people in the world, mostly in developing countries, but also in our own countries, who are hit quickest and hardest at these boundaries. Since Rio in, 2000, in 1992, sorry, we've globally been committed to sustainable development. And yet in this period, we've seen woefully few concrete results making those people who were precarious already ever more precarious. And added to that, if I take one of those planetary boundaries, in 2011, the Carbon Tracker Initiative, a team of London financial analysts and environmentalists, published a report in an effort to educate investors about the possible risks that climate change poses to their stock portfolios. They published an overview of the amount of carbon already contained in the proven coal, um, oil and gas reserves of the fossil fuel companies yeah. and the countries like Venezuela or Kuwait who act basically as fossil fuel companies. In short, that's the fossil fuel which is already accounted in the um, accounts uh, and calculated as an asset in the accounts of these companies and countries. And the key point is that that number, the number of the known um, and I stress conventional coal, oil and gas. This has nothing to do with shale gas or new unconventional forms of gas. But that number is 2,795 gigatons of carbon. And it's higher than the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's um, view of the maximum amount of carbon that can be burnt to stay within our planetary boundary of 2 degrees Celsius. At the IPCC's uh, carbon budget, as they call it, which is the amount of carbon which can be burnt to stay within that, that limit, is 565 gigatons of carbon. The existing assets in the world are five times higher. Now, I think we need to think as friends about what that means for our economies. These companies and countries are operating on the basis that their assets can be sold and burnt although we know that we can't do it if we want to survive. So our long-term health is in direct conflict with short-term stock market cycles. Now, a sustainable economy and a future for our species is only possible if we address this short-termism in our economies and, and the financial markets. We urgently need to address the way that environmental and social criteria are considered in financial investment risk calculations. And more fundamentally, we have to recognise that sustainable economies cannot be based on continuous value extraction and the shareholder value model of capitalism. This shareholder, mod shareholder value model creates mass speculation. To give you an idea of the scale of that speculation, in 2011, according to the International Bank of Settlements, over 90% of financial transactions globally were purely speculation. They weren't based on trade and services or hedging um, to ensure uh, coverage for currency rates. Speculation 
especially in the bond markets, and I know there was a focus last night on the Eurozone uh, and the, the, the bond markets inside the Eurozone, but speculation in the bond markets is essentially a direct transfer of wealth from the public to the private sector, and we need to recognise it for what it is. It makes the importance of action in the Eurozone through Eurobonds and other, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> other actions really fundamental. But it also means that we urgently need a financial transaction tax uh, to tackle and to put some seeds of sand, as James Tobin called them, into those wheels of, of international speculation. Now, it's not just our financial markets uh, that need reform, but we also need to address the financialization of the entire economy. As the financial crisis has meant that risk in the banking sector has been socialized through national bailouts, while bank profits and, um, have been privatised through excessive executive pay and bonuses, we can see this exact same trend in the real economy as well. Um, this creates perverse outcomes, such as leaps in share values following mass job losses, with the cost falling on the workers and the taxpayers affected, while the dividend goes to shareholders or the current context in which many firms engage in large-scale share buyback schemes uh, to bolster their stock market position and ensure dividends. To give you an idea of the scale of these share buyback schemes, in the US alone, and the figures for the EU are, fail, are of a similar magnitude, Fortune 500 companies have spent $3 trillion in the last decade buying back their own stock on the market. That's money which should have been invested in long-term interests, such as the workforce through training, wages, and so on, through capital goods investment, innovation, and R&D, but instead is being used to increase the inequality within companies between those um, at the top and in the shareholder and the, uh, the maintenance of, of dividends in, in maintaining the inequality in our society. Here we can clearly see that if we, and I always come back with sustainability, that we're always talking about a triangle, that we have the economy, the environment, and social. And if we only try and respond to two sides of the triangle, then we skew further the, the third element. If every solution has to have all three elements of the triangle in balance to maintain um, the, the structure. But if we, if we, see, if we look at um, tackling environmental protection without reforming our economic model, then we can already see that we're just intensifying the same fatal flaws in our system. From 2001 to 2010, US clean tech companies, so those who are identified as the green economy, bought back $290 million worth of their own shares. They're practicing exactly the same behavior as the old economy, this, these new sectors. But all's not lost. I've been told to give you some inspiration of what we can do, and I'm coming onto that, but I felt the environmental side hadn't been uh, covered adequately earlier. All's not lost. There are alternatives uh, to recession, to austerity, to environmental degradation and social crisis. But we need to address the underlying flaws in our economic system that are currently creating that rising inequality and undermining sustainability. In the 1940s, after the devastation of the Second World War, the US government took a brave uh, decision. And that decision was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. It's known informally as the GI Bill. That bill was a law that provided a range of benefits for returning veterans Benefits included low-cost mortgages, low-interest loans to start a business, cash payments of tuition and living expenses, and importantly, support for any veteran who wanted to attend college, high school, or to engage in vocational education. The long-term economic effects of that decision could be felt decades later. And it's the imagine, that's the level of imagination that we need uh, today. Since 2009, together with a group of members of the European Parliament, youth activists and others, we've been engaged in a major campaign calling for a European Youth Guarantee. 
a right for every young person to a decent job, proper training, or a quality apprenticeship within four months of unemployment for anyone under 25. Why can't we, as Europe, develop our own green GI Bill, supporting and investing in today's youth unemployed, young unemployed, to ensure the development of new goods and services and the investment needed to stimulate uh, the transition to a more a sustainable develop, um, economy. Time and again, we see that where there's a political will, there's a way. In February this year, um, after that campaign, and the campaign continues, six billion euros were allocated to implement Europe's youth guarantee. That's not yet enough. It's about a quarter of what estimates say is needed to really implement the guarantee, but it's a start. And it shows the benefits of the power of alliances and building concrete, reasoned alternatives. And this holds at all levels. And I think, fundamentally, the contribution of Quakers collectively must be to help this political will. As a trade union leader responsible for worker engagement in climate action and sustainable development, I often find myself remembering Rufus, Rufus Jones's words before the 1937 Second World Conference of Friends. He said, I've become a good deal disillusioned over big conferences and large gatherings. I pin my hopes to quiet processes and small circles in which vital and transforming events can take place. Despite my often and deep frustration about the current situation and the pace of transition, strength for me comes from the practical action that I see at the local level in Europe, and internationally, I should say. I take strength from the cooperation I see within the trade union movement and those working together with NGOs and companies working on environmental protection and social justice, all focused on changing the narrative. There are many places to start. Actions focused on changing the way we produce and consume goods and services, um, the way we conserve resources, how we can work smarter, but not necessarily longer, and avoid destroying the vital ecosystems provided by our seas and forests. Efforts to find alternatives to fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal, and channel investment into new technologies and the jobs and skills that go with them, whether that's solar and wind power, electric vehicles and trains, capturing and storing carbon emissions, save or saving energy at home and at work. I think today we should remember Advices and Queries 27. Live adventurously. When choices arise, do you take the way that offers the fullest opportunity for the use of your gifts in the service of God and the community? I'd like you to ask yourself in the workshops, what gifts can you bring to changing the narrative? Energy and resource efficiency on the scale that climate change and planetary boundaries demand will mean pushing for new models such as the circular economy, which is based on designing products that can be broken down at the end of their um, life and reused. It means reducing consumption of materials and energy, recycling much more, and reusing waste as a raw material for new production. And many people say, in an economic crisis and a financial crisis, how can we pay for this? Where can the money come from? But I think we should remember that money is not like soil or forests or fossil fuels. It's not a bounded thing in a way that a natural resource or an ecosystem is. It's a social contract, a measure of trust, a promise to pay, and it's long since separated from any underpinning finite materials such as gold. Therefore, in some senses, it's much more unlimited and flexible. And that's why both the US and EU um, governments were able to magic hundreds of billions of euros, dollars and pounds from thin air. Um, through the magic of double entry bookkeeping to bail out failed banks and pull the economy back from the brink. Well, today, we should be bailing out our planet with equal gusto. Financial systems are human constructions, they're not natural um, evolutions. Through rules and regulations, flows of money and investment off and financial risk can be directed and shifted. This may be through market regulation, corporate governance rules, 
social and environmental criteria on, on public investment, procurement and R&D support, the support of alternative forms of ownership, cooperatives and other um, alternative ownership forms, and fundamentally greater worker participation to balance shareholder values and shareholder interests in companies. I believe, I believe that yesterday uh, Trevor spoke about the need for a large-scale investment programme. In the union movement, we call this the Sustainable New Deal. But what can we as Quakers do to ensure that this Sustainable New Deal is realised? Well, I was thinking uh, when I was uh, preparing speaking this morning about um, my life as a, a young Quaker, and one of the things which hits out most for me is that in my meeting house in Middlesbrough, um, when I was little, there was always a poster on the wall of thinking globally and acting locally. This morning in Warsaw, uh, while we're sitting here, some of my colleagues are uh, taking part in an event inside the uh, climate negotiations where they're presenting what they'll be do doing, what they are doing practically in their own small circles and what they're doing practically to address the challenges of climate change and economic short-termism. And I thought that some of what they are presenting in Warsaw might also inspire the debate here. So I picked some of my colleagues at random. I haven't included their surnames, but if you want to get in contact with them for more information, I'm sure they'll be happy. Dominique from France will be presenting the latest round of the National Grenelle, um, on the environment and sustainable development. The Grenelle is the development of a national round table with all interests represented, which has been given the task of finding negotiated policies and actions. Now, there are lots of ways that you can develop um, round tables of this like, and examples include transition towns movement um, and local community initiatives that try to get different interests around the table. I think it'd be interesting to hear how your meetings have engaged in that, whether they've been involved, whether they've driven. Philip from the UK will be introducing the TUC, the UK Trade Union Confederation's Green Workplaces Project, in which over 1,300 workers' representatives have been trained and supported to engage in projects to green their own workplaces. These range from local projects um, on the micro level, more recycling, um, local mobility schemes, to large-scale multinational-wide changes in behaviour and consumption patterns. If you're still working, if you manage or are a trustee of an organisation, how can you engage, perhaps with others, to change its consumption patterns and behaviour? At EU level, how can QCA engage to support that shift in terms of changing consumption patterns. The Commission's currently struggling to get um, through uh, uh, the legislative process mandatory rules for, all com for companies, large companies in this case, for reporting on environmental and social sustainability. How could Quakers engage to ensure that those rules become mandatory across the EU? so that we can see transparently how companies are behaving and avoid a greenwashing agenda. Heidi from Denmark has been a strong advocate for the financing of the transition. The Danish pension fund, the ATP, pledged 1 billion euros to a new climate change fund for emerging economies at the previous COP15 in Copenhagen um, in December 2009. And recently, they've increased that to saying that they're going to reach 10%, a 10% share of their portfolio to be allocated to climate change investment. Given its size, the pension fund industry could play a key role in raising climate change related financing. According to our analyses in, in November last year, pension funds' net contribution to financing of climate change projects could reach about 301 billion US dollars by 2015 if they only allocated 5% of their overall portfolios. I think we should ask ourselves how Quaker finances are invested 
and how our personal monies are being used to support sustainability locally and internationally. Lisa from Germany represents the construction sector workers. In 1999, the German trade union movement was involved in the creation of the Alliance for Work and Environment, a retrofitting uh, programme serving 342,000 apartments uh, as of March 2006. From 2001 to 2004, the project was responsible for creating 25,000 jobs and saving an existing, an, an existing 116,000 jobs. In 2006 alone, it's cre it created 145,000 additional full-time jobs, which were um, as a result of increased levels of public-private spending. In the crisis, the German government decided to increase the funding for the Alliance of Work and, in and Environment. And that meant that in 2009 alone, 380,000 jobs were created as a result of the programme. Now, a year and a half ago, the German investment bank, public investment bank, the KFW, evaluated the programme. And what they found was that for every one euro invested, there were five euros created in the economy with co-benefits in terms of tax revenue, reduced unemployment costs and energy savings for the energy poor that the programme was targeted on. It's a triple win. It's the kind of triple win that we should be promoting actively. In Birmingham in the UK, a local group is trying to replicate the same programme. Through an alliance of the city council, environmentalist companies and unions, they use the, council, the, the city council's assets um, to guarantee a long-term loan from the European Investment Bank worth about £1.3 million to help the council equip 60,000 city homes with energy saving measures such as new boilers, improved insulation and solar panels. Energy is and will, will be a major question for our economies and societies. How as Quakers can we support more effectively the energy transition? When I get to Warsaw, on Monday morning, I'll be speaking in a public event on the need to use the opportunities created through the challenges of climate change and the need to address the economic crisis and invest in our economies to create large numbers of jobs for our young people. As I said at the beginning, we face many challenges, but the loss of a whole generation of our young people in Europe, a loss economically and socially, will fundamentally undermine any effort that we make in order to build a sustainable economy in the long term. And in the short term, the scale of the social crisis felt by many is creating a breeding ground for nationalist and xenophobic arguments. I believe that our peace and social justice testimonies compel us to act however we can, at whatever level, in whatever way, to use our gifts to further the right sharing of the world's resources and address that crisis. Thank you. my details so that it can be looked up on the web, some of them. In fact, uh, the um, speech I, I will pass over electronically and you can check all of the figures and, and facts. Okay, okay. Um, I'm quite used to chairing meetings, so um, take the lady at the back. Um, you mentioned some trade deals that uh, are going through or have already gone through. Uh, do these have to be submitted to any um, council of ministers or European Parliament? <coughs> what processes do they have to go through and where might there be opportunities to oppose them? Do you want to take a few or do you want to take a few? 
Should I answer one by one? What do you prefer, that I answer one by you. one? Are we <laughs> Penny's running against the tide. Um, <laughs> okay, on the uh, trade deals, um, <coughs> trade policy is an EU uh, competence, which means that the Commission negotiates for um, the whole of the EU. What happens in terms of process is the Commission has to ask for a no negotiating mandate that mandate is given by the member state governments. The Commission then starts the negotiations and the negotiations are then reported back to the member state governments uh, throughout the process so that they can uh, manage. It's probably one of the least transparent areas of EU policy. It's extremely difficult. I spend far too much of my time just trying to find documents. Um, and uh, the reality is that um, these trade deals um, are uh, secretive because some of the content of them would really raise hairs on people's heads <laughs> in terms of what's being put on the table. So if we look at the Canadian agreement, which has apparently, and why I say apparently just been finalised, because the Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, um, is very worried that the EU will forget about Canada. We started negotiating with Canada four years ago, um, but we've now started negotiating with another country in North America, which might be slightly larger than Canada. And the Canadians have a little bit of a complex that the EU will forget about Canada and focus all of the attention on the US. So the Canadian Prime Minister, also under domestic pressure, flew to Brussels to sign the US, the EU, that was a bit weird, the EU-Canada um, trade agreement. Trade policy, I should also say, is full of acronyms, which means that it's extremely difficult for um, uh, those who are campaigning against to use the same posters to challenge the same issues in every agreement, because the Canada agreement is called CETA, the US agreement is called TTIP, the trade and services is called TISA, so you, it's a, a, a forest of, of jargon and acronym. But the Canadian Prime Minister came to Brussels to allegedly sign the trade agreement. And it became clear that actually the trade agreement hasn't concluded, that there are still large parts of it which are being negotiated. But it, in order to show that Canada had got their agreement first, there was this kind of political show. Once the text is finalised, then the process is, um, is uh, becomes a little bit more transparent, but there's very little way that you can, you can change the actual content of the text. So the text, once it's signed by the two sides, then um, is translated into every language. It takes a number of months to get all of the legal translations done, and then it goes to the European Parliament. Now, one of the big changes with the Lisbon Treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, very controversial in a number of member states, but one of the big changes that the Lisbon Treaty brought was an increased role for the European Parliament in trade policy. It's quite a considerable change, but the change was a step towards increased um, Parliament roles. So the Parliament has the right to say yes or no, but not to change anything in the text. It gives us as, as actors outside the negotiations the space to be able to challenge the text on the table and to put pressure on, on um, uh, members of parliament to raise questions about certain elements. Up till now, there have been four trade negotiations um, since the parliament had this right, and the parliament's never had a majority to oppose a trade deal. So it's a very blunt right, and in a parliament which is conser conservative, liberal, dominated, it's very difficult to get a majority to oppose um, uh, a trade deal. We, um, we tried with a trade deal with Colombia and Peru. Um, Colombia is the country in the world where the most trade unionists are assassinated. They assassinate more trade unionists in Colombia than the entire world put together um, in, in, in reality every year. We raise fundamental human rights, it's not just trade unionists, it's also peace activists, it's human rights defenders and, and others. 
And we raised these human rights questions in the European Parliament. We had a big debate. It pushed the, prolonged the debate in the Parliament, but ultimately the majority fell with support for tree, free trade. So it's a very, it's a very difficult process to, to halt once the negotiations are complete. But whilst the negotiations haven't been concluded, what our, I think our job um, as trade justice activists is to increase the transparency of what's going on so that people know what their governments and what the Commission um, Trade Directorate is negotiating. And so that there's a public debate about what's being put on the table. Um, and um, and uh, that's, that's depressingly kind of the, the frame. But it's clear that for the US, to give you a bit of a perspective on the US negotiations, the objective is, it has been decided between the EU governments and the US administration. Obama wants to have the trade agreement at the end of his term. So that means negotiations within a year and a half concluding. And that's extremely tight when you think about the scale of the economic relationship between the EU and the US. Um, the other element is these are the first two negotiations that we've had with advanced, or you know, kind of advanced um, economies in the world. We don't have trade tariffs. It's not a it's not a negotiation about reducing trade tariffs. The only obstacles between trade between the EU and the US are regulatory. And that means rules and regulations which have been adopted by democratic parliaments, whether it's at the European level or whether it's at the national level. And that's a real challenge as to how uh, you ensure uh, the right of states to regulate their own economies and to provide public services um, within the framework of these large constitutional agreements between, between countries. I hope you tell me if I'm not being clear. Oh. Um, yep. Well, that, that, that was clear. I mean, I, I appreciate people that want to move on, but just, just to give us a tiny bit more of context, can you, you said that in, the, the Canada deal would raise hairs on that <coughs> next. Can you just give us a little example of why? Or? I certainly can. <laughs> um, one of the things which is included in the Canada agreement is the first EU trade agreement, which includes something which sounds very simple which is called st Investor State Dispute Settlement. And there are lots of nods, <laughs> which is reassuring. Yes. So the Investor State Dispute Settlement is essentially creates a parallel legal system. The legal system exists um, of international tribunals where multinational companies can take governments to court and sue them for loss of profits, if they feel that regulations have um, expropriated their, uh, their companies. Now, I'll give you an example of some of the cases that we're facing in, in investor state dispute settlement courts at the moment. Um, Germany has been taken to court by Vattenfall, big energy sector company, because Vattenfall argue that the decision to uh, turn off Germany's nuclear uh, sector has undermined Vattenfall's future profits and is essentially expropriation. A decision by a democratically elected government on its national energy policy challenged in court by a multinational company. People, people often say to me, one of the big campaigns in Germany and the big campaigns in the UK and elsewhere is around minimum wages, around the how you ensure the uh, the, the kind of floor for wages in the economy. There's a very big debate in Germany at the moment about whether there's a need for a national minimum wage. Now, if we look at what's happened through investor state courts, Egypt, after the uh, revolution and the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring on the, was you know, primarily down to unemployment levels, social concerns, feeling rising poverty, feeling, uh, feelings of economic insecurity. One of the changes that the, gov the Egyptian government made was to decide to increase its minimum wage. And immediately, Veolia, which is one of the world's biggest waste and uh, waste management water companies, took the Egyptian government to court, 
to the international arbitration courts suing them for loss of profit. Now, the effect may be that the international court decides that there isn't a case, that it's legitimate for the government uh, to, to um, regulate. But the government has to cover all of their legal costs in that whole process and in fighting uh, the legal case. Which means that what we see in reality is that there's a real effect of regulatory freeze. That governments don't implement changes which are demanded by their citizens, which are necessary nationally because of concerns about um, the implications of being sued for compensation by multinationals. And that's a real freeze on the right of democratic governance and the right to, to regulate. The, one of the, the reasons why this has become such a big issue, and those who are from the UK, I don't know what proportion, I'm kind of guessing, but uh, what, who, who's from the UK, but one of the reasons why this has become a really big issue in, in Britain is because if a future Labour government wanted to renationalise the National Health Service, then after this current privatisation through the last health and social care bill, then there's a real question about whether international multinationals in the health and social care sectors could actually um, challenge <coughs> that renationalisation. So it's, it's fundamental questions about how we organise our welfare states, how we organise our, our economies and how we regulate activities. It's essentially an, a structure which gives multinational power, multinational companies powers above and beyond governments. And there's no, and I just finished on one point, there's no transparency and there's no route into those tribunals for any citizens groups, anybody representing interests of users or um, concerned groups, workers, environmentalists, anyone who maybe was uh, a driving force behind the piece of legislation at national level. So that's one example where the Canadian agreement is actually putting something in place which we've never seen in terms of EU. We, in national level, some member states have signed up to this, but at EU level, it's the first time that the EU is signing up to it. I'm just, uh, sorry, I just want to check for a second um, if somebody who has a program, what time, how long the session goes to? Sorry. 10.30. 10.30? Yeah. Um, Half an hour for questions. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, the, there was, a, well, I think there was a guy with glasses, yes. <laughs> and then we'll come to the back. The question oh. I, I asked, is there an end date to that treaty, to that agreement? Is there an end date? To the, to the Canadian agreement? To the Canadian agreement. Canada and Europe? N no, I mean, it, that depends on, an yeah, it's a permanent agreement until the two sides decide to end it. You would have to negotiate to, to okay, end it. Okay, and then, so this is what we need to be thinking about. How do you end that agreement? Yeah. Um, as the other piece of uh, work that I think probably we need to really seriously consider in QCA is see who is doing the actual negotiations and get in and start to talk with them. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, uh, on the commission side, they're civil servants that are doing this. We need to know who the civil servants are and have the conversations with them. That, to me, is part of QCEA work. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we can actually do those kind of things, we can make big changes. Now, we are entitled to have a submission as a regular citizen, but as an, an NGO, we can have a bigger influence, and especially if we pull together with other NGOs, we can have a major influence on the civil service, which is, they're just civil servants doing the job. We need to remember that, and we need to influence the way they're thinking as to how it happens in the future. But we need to actually find out how we end this agreement. Yeah. Um, maybe one, so the, the second part of the question is the easiest. On the Commission website, you have the names and email addresses and telephone numbers of everybody who's involved in the negotiations and every who's responsible for every table of the negotiations. So that's fairly easy to, to um, and in general, they're pretty open to meeting and hearing the views of, of different organisations. Whether that's taken into account, if there's mass lobbying from industry is another question, but uh, um, that's, they're definitely willing to listen. Um, how you end the agreements is really interesting, 
because there are some countries around the world, and that's why um, these uh, negotiations, these three negotiations that I mentioned are so important. The uh, US TTIP, the Canada CETA, and fundamentally this agreement which is happening outside the WTO called the Trade and Services Agreement, the TISA, which is negotiated by the very good friends of services. That, um, which I um, imagine you can imagine what that means. Um, they, um, uh, basically, they are trying to build up a, a kind of critical mass, which means that they can then go back into the WTO block dough around with a fait accompli for other countries. Now, I think what's interesting is that with the changing dynamics in the global context, there are other countries who aren't willing to sign up to this very neoliberal agenda. So you have, for example, South Africa, who are going through and ending all of their investment agreements. And they're putting sun and ensuring that sunset clauses are implemented, even if they have to pay damages. They've got a strategy of getting themselves out of every agreement. In the EU, you have countries that haven't got any investment agreements, and Ireland's one of them. They don't have any national investment agreements um, with bilateral investment agreements. So why would Ireland then sign up to an EU agreement which um, uh, decreases its national power? I mean, we have to break it down and think about where the potential allies at the national, national level are. And, um, and there's definitely a large trade justice movement already kind of running with this, which I'm sure um, it wouldn't take much effort for Quakers at whatever level to, to lock into. Yeah, it needs to be pulled together in a very constructive manner. Yeah, absolutely. We're always constructive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, colleague with, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your speech, which was really, really helpful as well as, as very inspiring. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you said early on in your talk when you uh, mentioned about negotiating with Polish miners yeah. as well as with corporations and governments. Mm -hmm. Because, it, as I'm sure you know well, campaigning on environmental issues is sometimes presented as being um, in, in conflict with people's everyday basic needs, feeding people today and tomorrow, people's needs at work. And as a trade unionist, I'm sure you're well aware that there are some trade unions that appear to play up to that rather than challenging it. Mm -hmm. uh, my own experience of Britain campaigning the arms trade is that, understandably, trade unions who have workers working in the arms trade are concerned about their workers' jobs. Understandably, they're not at the front of anti-arms campaigns. Mm -hmm. But what's more worrying is that sometimes they're actually lining up with arms companies to, to defend the arms industry. And I found myself in the weird position of appearing on radio programs arguing against a union official rather than an army. And I, um, I wondered if you, as a Quaker trade unionist, had any thoughts on how we, within the trade union movement, um, challenge the notion of a sort of short-term representation that leads us as trade unionists to end up defending the economic Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, mm -hmm. and it's pretty much why I've got a lot more grey hair than I should have for my age. But um, you're you're absolutely right. The I, I think the other thing is that it's trade unions and trade unionists in different industries are quite often um, pushed to the fore by uh, the industry and by the management in the public debate because it's more difficult to counter uh, the workforce than to counter the, the management and the company um, itself. So you quite often find in corporate um, communication strategies that we'll let the unions go in and talk about this because then um, it undermines the opposition's argument. Now, in terms of what I've found in, in trade unions, I think, and that's where I come back to Rufus Jones, I think the only way that you can um, break that down is by sitting and talking through the whole um, issue with the people who are involved themselves. 
And what we've done in terms of Poland, um, with more or less success, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, is that I've spent a lot of time sitting with Polish mining and energy sector workers saying, what exactly is the actual problem that you have with, um, with for example, climate change? So if you go into, a, and people might have seen last Sunday, you had um, Polish uh, mining workers demonstrating against climate science and arguing that we should ignore the science. If you actually talk to them, they recognise the science. But the problem is, the science challenges their very way of life and means a fundamental change. And what they haven't seen is where the alternative comes from. Because partly, and I think it's only fair, the, it's much easier for politicians to um, say, we can't do anything, our hands are tied, it's somebody else who's forcing us to do this. And the Polish government has done that. They've said, the EU's forcing us to implement this climate policy, and that means your jobs are going. But it's absolutely false. Polish mining jobs are going because coal is cheaper from the US than it is from Poland. It's economics. It's globalization. It's the fact that and jobs are lost in the Polish energy sector because we've liberalized the energy sector and sold public energy companies off, restructured, rationalized, modernized, which has meant fewer workers. So it's nothing to do with climate change. It's to do with economic change in the economy. I think if you can get beyond what seem like really offensive views sometimes and start having a conversation about what really is at the centre of the problem, then you can start to try and find some solutions for working your way out of it. And what we found is that engaging um, Polish mining workers and energy sector workers in a discussion about how you ensure, I mean, I'm from the northeast of England, heavy mining community, heavily hit by the closure of pits in the 19... 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, the closure of pits in a very brutal way, which meant that you then didn't have really any social program to tackle the fact that you had communities which were in crisis. And lots of the social problems today are because of the way that um, economic restructuring was undertaken. If you put in place a plan with people locally, then you can manage restructuring of the economy in a in a more socially acceptable way but it's labor intensive in terms of time in terms of trying to build those alliances and i think to an extent that's where quakers are pretty good because we're happy to sit and plow through the details and discern and think about how you can get around things which seem like insurmountable obstacles and i think that's that's, um, that's one way. And I think it's the same in the arms trade. If you talk to the workers in Glasgow, along um, kind of, you know, Faz Lane or wherever, what they care about is what are their kids going to do? What are the jobs in the local area which will mean that the kids who are in school now will have jobs in the future? <coughs> so it's about, and I, I had a long conversation with Campaign Against the Arms, tra arms Trade about it. Because I said, if you sat down with the local shop stewards, and said, what are your ideas about your local area's economic future and regeneration? And they said, no, no, they, they just oppose what we're saying. But we need people who can bring, you know, Northern Ireland, the peace process was about small circles of bringing people with very different views together to try and understand each other's perspective and to try and find solutions. Our economic challenges are equally complicated uh, the energy sector is extremely complicated and we need those those dialogues um, it's not a, you know a, a, a kind of um, at the moment it's not a, a life and death death situation like um, Northern Ireland was um, in, in the troubles but it's the same kind of mediation skills which I think are, are urgently needed and um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my kind of perspective, that's my experience, and it's really difficult, and you take two steps forward, and you take 
three steps back and then you one step forward and you, you feel you're never sure if you're really moving it in the right direction but the um, the engagement is absolutely crucial to, to bring people around. <coughs> Sorry, I'll try and answer questions far shorter. Um, uh, right at the back with a pen in his hand. And then... uh, could you say uh, something please about uh, the long-term effects of youth unemployment? Um, we, we know a lot about the effects of unemployment per se, that it uh, increases heart attacks in the people who are unemployed, uh, increases depression and suicide, alcoholism, obesity, uh, minor crime, um, but uh, for 50% or between 10 and 50% of young people, it really must affect their lives for the, but is, is there any science about this, what do we know? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of research into the, uh, particularly into the health effects of unemployment, as you said. Um, there's also um, a lot of research into the um, economic effects uh, long periods of youth unemployment mean a reduced um, uh, way, average wage across the whole of your life. It means you're more likely to um, be in a more precarious position throughout. I mean, it's, there are effects across the whole of, uh, in every dimension of, of somebody's life. Um, I, I was really struck, just to give a personal experience, about two, three years ago, there was a march of the uh, Spanish indignados. There was the movement of people in the street, um, the kind of predecessor to <coughs> Occupy in the US. And, um, and they marched from all, lots of Spanish cities to Brussels to say to the uh, EU policy makers, this is our experience. And it was, it was all kinds of impacts on their lives. Um, in terms of uh, uh, not just the, the kind of health and economic, but um, the, the value that they felt that they had to society, which I think is, is really crucial. Um, if you look at um, kind of the, the need for people to feel that society cares about them, then it, that's a really fundamental value which holds together our social cohesion. Um, and, and at the moment, there's a complete lack of trust. And it's, it, I think it has major implications in terms of our democracies, because that lack of trust means that why bother engage in political activism? Why bother engage in voting? Why bother engage in standard political and uh, democratic um, structures? So you have a kind of marginalisation in that dimension as well. Um, and, and unfortunately, and I say this very carefully in this room, but if only older people vote, then it means that politicians only respond to the concerns of the elderly. And what we've seen in terms of austerity measures is that to a large degree, pensioners have been protected with all of the burden falling on the young and on working age people. So there's, it has a fundamental attack uh, it fundamentally undermines our intergenerational solidarity as a society. And I think that will also have long-term um, impact. Um, and, I mean, obviously there are those who a period of unemployment makes them think about what they're going to do, try alternative things, start up, and they're the, the, lucky, the lucky few. But for a lot of people, it's extremely depressing and has a really serious impact on particularly on mental health as well. So, and the, all of these uh, delayed effects, you see them um, decades sometimes later. So it's very difficult to, to, to judge, but there is quite a body of, um, of research about, about the effects of unemployment. Um, right at the back, and then I'll come forward. In the global situation you're describing, where multinationals are increasingly ruling the world, Church, which what churches, faith groups, 
who are already taking initiatives in the UK, is that a sensible place to be putting our energies? Just to check, disinvestment as in disinvestment from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the argument from the Commissioner for Climate Action is that disinvestment is the most urgent policy which is needed. Because you, st you then start to force companies to, to change their strategies. Mm -hmm. And you have an impact on, on their, their bottom lines and on their, their balance sheets. And unfortunately, that's where many, many company uh, directors and boards really look. So certainly, um, if you look at the statements from Connie Hedegaard, who is the European Commissioner for Climate Action, a lot of her focus recently is how you link up disinvestment uh, campaigns and strategies in relation to fossil fuels. Um, and that's very clearly the, the argument also coming out of the, um, I mentioned the Carbon Tracker Initiative on the, you know, the amount of money which is already on the books of, of fossil fuel companies. That's also, um, they're providing a lot of the research input into disinvestment um, uh, campaigns. So I think it is important. It's what do you do with the money once you've disinvested from one place? Where how do you use it um, in a you know in an effective way? Um, and um, and I think there you know the campaigns around more ethical funds. Um, this link to um, ensuring that um, portfolios include. Um, uh, climate change and um, and social justice as part of their portfolios. I mean, there are ways that you can uh, you can shift it. Um, um, and then locally, I mean, there are things which you can invest your money to support your local area, like investing in credit unions, investing in in local investment um, funds, and and so on. So there are lots of Alternative routes, uh, but uh, but disinvestment is important. In the green top. Thank you. Um, thank you for your inspiring talk and your starting to give us leads on how to change the narrative towards a more sustainable society, which is with, with the title of your talk. Um, I'm inspired by that. I'm involved in my own version of trying to change the narrative. Um, but what struck me listening this morning was that those with the power and the money who have, hold the belief system that we should not live beyond our means, but we have to live beyond our environmental means, those with the power and the money hold that belief system, and that that is leading to us borrowing more than we can pay back earlier every year. When is the time for us, we Quakers, to move towards attention, at least some of our attention, to adaptation mm. as opposed to continuing this tiny effort towards mitigation. Mm. When do we need to alert ourselves to the need for adaptation to what's to come? Um, the IPCC, if we just think about climate, the IPCC. Um, have set, have put, I, I would advise, I mean, it's a quite technical report, but the executive summary of the latest report from the IPCC is quite readable. And, um, and in it, it includes a really, I think, terrifying but brilliant graph, which shows that the longer you wait, the more dramatic the change has to be. So the answer is we have to be doing both. We have to be doing mitigation and adapt adaptation now. Are we though? Because we're still giving all our Yeah, efforts. yeah, no, adaptation is adaptation is the poor relative of miti of mitigation at the moment. But at EU level I'll just speak about EU level. Um, there is a European adaptation strategy. Um, much of it is focused on public health, on uh, coastal areas, and infrastructure, and, and so on. Um, it's, it gets a lot less airtime 
uh, than, um, than mitigation, but in every conclusion they say how important it is, which probably means that it'll get less airtime. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those strange, strange things. But um, uh, it's, I, I mean, it, yeah, it's fundamental. Um, and, uh, I, I don't hear it spoken about in Quaker yeah. environment. Yeah. Well, maybe that's an impulse. You have an <laughs> EU strategy, and uh, there's a possibility uh, for QCA to look at at um, what adaptation would mean and how Quakers... I think sometimes, excuse me, we need to point the finger this way and not that way. Yeah. I notice, and I'm one of them, who's complained about certain things this weekend. There wasn't a drink after we arrived. There wasn't anywhere to put the soap or the towel in the shower and things like that. And I think, hang on a minute. <laughs> We're not in the Are we really realising that apart from taking the moral high ground all the time and pointing the finger that way, you know, how resilient are we? Yeah, yeah. Do you got here? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Can I stand up so that I yeah, can, gosh, can so that people can hear so that you can hear me. Um, two quick things, please. Thank you very much, Judith. i I'd just like to remind all friends about the importance of opportunities for young people through Quaker work and I, I do think Judith is a living example of that as a former <laughs> QCA uh, assistant that um, what, what she's achieved so far at such a very young age and, and I do want to encourage you to remind you all of the importance of opportunities for young people at QCA to encourage young people to go to the Geneva Summer School, to encourage young people to come to conferences like this. Did you all in your meetings look at who might appropriately come? And did you ask your younger people, can they afford to go? Can, they, can you help them to come? Young people, certainly in Britain, do not have money in their pockets. They are all carrying enormous debts if they've been in education. And it is undermining their confidence to even ask to come to something like this. So please do think about them and please do engage with them and say, how can we help you do what you feel led to do? And I'd just like to mention that I worked at the UN, CUNO New York, in the 1980s. And I remember reading the climate change stuff then and I thought, oh! oh my, we've got a big job ahead of us and I'm hearing the same thing again today and that's, that's a long time ago, friends. That's a long time ago. We worked on the PrEP conference, which obviously took place in 1992 and uh, lots of stories there. I'd just like to ask you briefly, Julie, I'm very struck because I represent Brittany in meeting at quite a number of um, interfaith and interchurch uh, events. The religious understanding of our relationship with the planet and the earth, uh, our religious understanding is radically different from the religious understanding of many other faiths about our relationship with the planet, in that a lot of religious teaching is about humans have dominion over the planet. It's there for us to consume because we are chosen. Now, Quakers don't think that. Um, I, I speak for Britain Yearly Meeting. Obviously, other yearly meetings may have come to different places on that. But we don't have dominion. We have to develop a right relationship. That is our understanding. So again, um, thinking of your um, engagement with the Polish miners, their, their religious and political cultural understanding may is most likely coming from the Catholic Church, which has a different understanding about, although that's shifting under the new Pope, very interesting, um, very healthy, friends, um, that they will have been taught from a very early age that it's theirs to consume because they're human and they have dominion over. And I, I just throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think, uh, I think that's, Absolutely, absolutely right. I think the um, other thing is the US debate, the, the kind of Tea Party debate of um, a very evangelical um, uh, 
Christianity, saying that you know this is the way that it's meant to be. If we if we interact, then we're actually um, changing God's plan in a way. And I think that's a, a quite scary interpretation of of what's going on as well. But um, yeah, I, I think there are like two minutes left, so maybe we take two and then wrap it, it, I'm the chat. It's Marissa's thing. Oh, sorry, Marissa. <laughs> Marissa and then the colleague here with the blue top. Yes, I wanted to bring in an um, uh, ecumenical dimension to this because uh, I, I take um, a, a more um, optimistic view of where the churches are. I think that, that there is a greater scope for um, new understandings so around the concept of shalom, the, the sort of the, the sense that, that peace, equilibrium, health, wholeness, and, and these things sort of go way back. So there is a kind of a, a potential for conversations uh, in an interfaith as well as in a, as an inter-Christian um, understanding. So I wonder about whether we can do that mm -hmm. a little bit more um, at the European level. Um, so where are you know, churches, um, you know, the, the CEP, the Conference of European Churches, the World Council of Churches, and those kind of dimensions. But I was also thinking about other big partners that we haven't heard about today. But Russia and China are the ones that come to mind, India, Brazil, and other sort of uh, larger economies. Where are the relationships there, and what is the potential for some kind of change coming from uh, uh, the inevitable decline of the West and the rise of different um, systems? which are not necessarily more desirable, I have to say, perhaps I'm prejudiced in that. But I'd like to hear you say something about those relationships, mm. please. Okay. And then maybe, and then I'll conclude and wrap up. Um, thank you very much. And I, I particularly liked your ref reference to the, the nine boundaries which the Stockholm Environment Institute said must not be crossed. And one thing that... that, that um, Strike, struck me out because I've read those boundaries is that three of them are already crossed. Yeah. The, the one about nitrogen fertilizers is way past the boundary and polluting the seas. Uh, the climate change is already crossed and people are desperate about that one. But the one that's much more serious is the biological, that we are destroying the species, we are uh, the, the little tiny bugs as well as the big, big things uh, in a big way. And uh, there's legislation around Britain about building houses or in Somerset, all in our be most beautiful valleys, which strikes me as just terrible. And what I also notice is the number of friends and family who have a second home, a holiday home, a flat in London, and who, like me, live in a house much bigger than my needs. And uh, it struck me that somewhere along the line, rationing, of some kind, quotas, has to come into our thinking, and uh, I find myself wondering whether I should have travelled all the way here <laughs> on Eurostar for this. Um, Rationing. Yeah. Well, well, I'll come. I'll come to. Um, I'll do them in order. So, in terms of um, relations with the BRICS, I mean, I. Um, I said it in passing in relation to South Africa um, and this the fact that the EU in terms of the trade uh, policy is very clearly negotiating with uh, the other OECD countries and in the back in the context of that is this uh, very um, interesting kind of changing relationship with the with Brazil Russia India uh, China and South Africa, the BRICS, um, because if the opposition to that very orthodox neoliberal model of trade and investment relationships is coming from those countries. So if you look at what the, what the background is of the EU-US negotiations, both the EU and the US want to have a trade agreement with China. What they, and this is kind of all of the context of it, but partly what they want is first to join their own forces and then to go to Beijing with a common front because of the, the global dynamics. So there's a real, a real uh, challenge. But on the other hand, on climate change, there's real cooperation 
There's increasing cooperation between the EU and China around research and development in new technologies, in industrial strategies and so on. So it's quite a complicated geopolitical context, um, I would say, at the moment. And things are moving very, very quickly. Um, and, um, and I think that there are possibilities of interesting partnerships. I mean, if you look at um, opposition to a neoliberal investment agenda, then South Africa is a clear partner in that opposition. Um, Australia, up until the change in government, I don't know, I suspect it will shift back in the other direction, but Australia has been quite a partner on opposing um, investment agreements as well, and has um, and has also been a key partner on climate action. So it's, but that shifting back, depending on the the kind of political dynamics in the country. So it, it's quite a, a a shifting scene, and um, um, and it will be. It makes um, the negotiations at UN level. Um, I think far more difficult because you don't have the traditional block of developed countries negotiating with uh, developing countries, which has meant that all of these UN processes have stalled in the last period as the, the power dynamics between countries um, uh, change. Um, in terms of uh, the, the boundaries and, and whether we need then to put in place kind of uh, rationing, um, I mean, it, it's true, three of those boundaries have passed. It's biodiversity is the one which has really rocketed through the, through the sky in terms of loss of fauna and fauna. Flora and fauna. Fauna and fauna. Oh, no, um, and, um, and, I mean, if we don't start seeing, um, you know, the, the choice, I think, it comes back to what I was saying about the IPCC report of where you start taking action. If, you, if we don't start seeing a shift in the right direction in terms of um, addressing uh, these, these boundaries, um, then the choices, the policy choices which are available become ever more radical. And, and I think that's what needs to be recognised in the public debate. The longer that you delay, the more painful the whole transition will be, whichever area you're looking at, and the more costly it will be. People say, you know, we, we have a very clear debate about whether um, investment in climate action, whether it's adaptation or mitigation, is um, economically sound at the moment. Shouldn't we sort out our economies and then invest? The reality is, the longer, and Stur Lord Stern's report in 2006 made the economic case and said, the longer that you wait, the more expensive the bill will be. And the more expensive the bill will be in all three dimensions, economically, socially, and environmentally. So we need to have a shift um, in, in that narrative. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to add something which Hasn't, uh, hasn't really come out, which is quite interesting, because next year is quite a crucial year at European level. We have the European Parliament elections, which are the next chance uh, to shift. We have three key institutions at European level, basically. The European Parliament elections will be in May. There's a real chance to shift where the uh, political um, direction of the Parliament move goes. And, and the priority given to this kind of agenda. Um, there's, uh, after the Parliament, the new Commission will be appointed, and according to the Lisbon Treaty, the Member States have to take into account the biggest group in the new Parliament in terms of the President of the Commission, which means that you could see a shift in the Parliament majority, and then a shift in the political direction of the European Commission as well. And then we just have to sort out some member state governments. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, I couldn't possibly comment further. <laughs> um, but I mean, there is a possibility to actually affect the political framework um, which, is, which is framing this debate. All of these policy, what Trevor presented last night, lots of what I've presented today is about political choices 
And it's about whether politicians take the political choices or whether they, like I said about the Polish government, they decide to sit back and blame other people for what's being imposed. Now, I think uh, we have to also think about that political um, engagement and the chances offered by, by next year. Um, uh, and I put my cards, since it's the end of the session, I put my cards on the table that I decided that the only choice I wasn't really given much of a choice by some people, but I decided that the uh, choice for me was to stand for Parliament and to stand for election and to try and defend this agenda myself. So in the European elections, I will be top of a party's list and um, will hope to be arguing for this kind of more progressive agenda in a new Parliament. But I don't want to be in a new Parliament full of rabid climate sceptics and, <laughs> and nationalists. So we need a, a movement across Europe which is backing a, a kind of pro progressive, sustainable vision of our economies in the future. Um, maybe I'll, I'll end it there and we can go for coffee. And I know not everybody asked their question, but I'm staying around for a little bit. So um, I'm happy to keep on. Thank you very much to Judith, um, that was wonderful. As she mentioned, I think the next activity is coffee. Um, although I think the energy in the room is, is quite high, so people don't necessarily need coffee. Afterwards, there's the workshop session number one, so please check which room you're supposed to be in on your little personalized timetables, and you can go straight to there at the time that the workshop should start. Thank you.